thousand dollars up there. <laughs> so it's really a big, big enterprise. Um, so one question then is, okay, how did all these uh, physicists then actually find the Higgs boson? So the theories that I talked about that Higgs and, and, and Engelbert uh, developed, they tell us um, uh, that there might be a Higgs, but it didn't tell us what the mass was of that Higgs boson. Right? So the, essentially the weight of the Higgs boson. So that's something we had to determine experimentally. And that's why it partly took so long, because people didn't know where it was. And until we had an accelerator and a, that had sufficient energy to see it, we, wouldn't, um, um, we weren't able to experimentally find it. But once you know the mass, or if you say, if the Higgs boson mass is whatever it is, the theory then tells you everything else that you need to know. It tells you how it will be produced, how it will decay, which happens almost instantly into other particles. And so, you know, again, we've searched for many years using smaller accelerators and didn't find it uh, until we finally had enough energy with the LMC to be able to, to discover it. Um, so I want to give you an example of how you find uh, the Higgs boson. Um, what you do is you choose a specific way that this Higgs boson will decay and look for it. And to give you the example, which was the one that sort of was the original discovery of the Higgs boson, was a decay of a Higgs boson into those gammas over there, those are photons, those are particles of light. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we want something that's easy to recognize, because you think of our detector as a digital camera, so it's taking these electronic pictures, uh, lots of pictures, so you want to be able to pick out the picture that represents what you think is a Higgs boson. And you'd like one that occurs often. If it's very rare, then you might miss that picture and you'd never, never see it. So what you have to do, what we do then, is use Einstein's theory of relativity to tell us what the mass of the parent particle is, the exposure, which is what we're looking for, based on what the energies and the, and the direction in which those um, decay particles, in this case the two photons, which way they went. In other words, if you know everything about the two photons that appear over there, you can use Einstein's equation to tell you what the mass of the parent particle is. Okay? I wrote the equation there. It doesn't matter if you're not familiar with it. That the takeaway over there is simply to say that if I know the two photons, I can figure out what the mass of the parent particle is, if it came from the parent particle. So what you do is you take... You look at a, this picture, this collision. In that picture, you might see photons. You take one photon, another photon. You apply that formula, and you say, OK, let me pretend it came from a parent particle. And you write down, using that formula, what the mass of that parent particle is. Okay? Um, if the two photons didn't come really from a parent particle, you can still apply the equation. It's just that it'll give you sort of a random number. But if they all came from one parent particle, they all give you the same number, the mass of that parent particle. Okay, so what you do then is you, at, you collect them all. You take these pictures, you do the calculation, and you write down what the mass of that particle is, and you build up a plot that shows you how many that I got of that mass by collecting all these pairs of photons. And eventually you want to look or a bump in that picture, and if you see that bump, that's an indication that it came from one kind of parent particle. So I want to give you uh, one sort of uh, example, which is a little bit to answer the question of, you know, if you found, can you find just one Higgs? Is that enough? And the answer is no, and I give you the following example. So imagine the lower left corner there is our detector. And our detector produces these pictures, right? These electronic pictures. So let me classify the pictures by color. And so you see these blocks over here, those are representing the pictures. You start collecting them, you put them along the axis over there according to what color those pictures are. And then maybe at this point you start, you say, oh, look, I've discovered the, I actually don't know what color it is. I've discovered the yellow part, right? Because I see this bump over here. Maybe that means it. But the trouble is that statistically that isn't sufficient to actually say you've seen it. That could just be a statistical fluctuation. So you have to take more data. And you keep on taking data like this, uh, classifying all those pictures until eventually what you see is 
Now a big bump, a red thing over here, and you say, ah, now I've statistically seen a red part. Right? Now, let me show you a little bit sort of what it is that we actually have to do, because it isn't color that we're looking for. We're doing things like taking those two photons and calculating their, their mass. But here's kind of the, the, the problems with that, which is what I'm looking at over here is a representation of our detector. If I had a, I don't have my props. Um, if I took a piece of paper and I folded it into a cylinder and I pointed it head on at you, what you would see is a circle. And so what you're seeing over here is the end view of our detector. Uh, if I take that view, that circle, and I tilt it on it, I mean, I move it 90 degrees like this, when you look at it, it looks like a rectangle. So that's what you're seeing over here. Or I could take that circle of paper that I have and unfold it into a flat plane. And if I do that, I end up with a plane like this. Now remember that when the particles collided, a whole bunch of new particles were created. Those are represented by these lines over here and by the blobs of energy that you see deposited in the detector over here. And it's perhaps clearest over here. Here you see the blobs. There's yellow blobs and another yellow blob. And when you unfold it, you see that there are two big blobs of energy like this. Um, and the, top, the height of the blob that you see over here tells you how much energy there is. Uh, and then I show you another picture over here uh, where um, it kind of looks the same. But they're actually quite different. This one comes from two quarks that come out of the, out of the decay, and they eventually turn into particles that we measure. Uh, and here is the decay of a Z boson into two electrons. So just to indicate the difference, if you saw this, this is kind of an ordinary kind of event. We're not that interested in them. Um, this one looks like a Z boson because these two blobs uh, represent the two electrons over there. And uh, if you've done this in 1984, you've been another Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, uh, and it's subtle over here. These are kind of spread out, these blobs. These are a little tighter. So that's one of the differences that you see over there. Let's look at back to the Higgs boson decaying into two photons. Here we have a potential candidate event into two photons that you see uh, coming off here, these blobs over here. If they're left in this green region, that's the electromagnetic calorimeter, which is sensitive to electrons and photons uh, in there. And, and so you see these two blobs over here. Now you could do that, take that Einstein equation, calculate if these came from a parent particle, what the mass of that particle is. So I'm going to do that um, over here. And what I'm going to show you is um, a, a little bit just of the calculation that we do, and then I'll show you some of the data that goes, that, that gave rise to that. So imagine you had Higgs boson, the case into two photons like this. Okay? Now what you could do is you could measure the energy of those two. That's what your detector does. And they have an angle that separates them. And if you remember, of course, remember the equation that I showed you, uh, that if you take these energies that you have over here at this angle, you can calculate what the mass of that parent particle was. Um, if, and so that would give you that the mass of these, the, the uh, jargon that we use is the gamma gamma mass, namely the mass of the two photons. In this case, it would be equal to the mass of the Higgs. If, on the other hand, um, they came from two different particles, so this thing became into a photon, this other one into a photon, you would do the same calculation, energy, and, and the angle between them, but now when you do the calculation of the two photons, it's not the Higgs mass, it's something else, sort of random. And so now what we're going to do is along this axis, plot this M gamma gamma, <coughs> and see how many of them we get, that's the vertical axis over here, and you're going to see this evolve in time. See, so see time going over here, we keep on collecting data, nothing much interesting looks like it's happening over here. Those are the random collections of those two photons. But now if you stare at it hard enough and you take enough data, you see that over here, there is a statistically significant bump. That bump, which if you follow it down, is around 125 GeV, is the evidence for the Higgs boson decay in the two photons. And so that's what we do, search for that bump. Uh, and that's that guy over there. Whereas the other one gives rise to this kind of flat background. It's just harder to make heavier ones.
ones over here, so it's a little less of 